Welcome to the Good Faith Podcast. I'm David French with Curtis Chang, and we've got um, a lot to cover in this podcast, and it's going to be, we're going to cover some pretty heavy subjects. So just warning you on the way in here, but we're going to do it with a guest, a very special guest, uh, someone that Curtis has known for almost 20 years now. So since you've known her for so long, Curtis, why don't you introduce her? David, this is someone that's been very important, a uh, very special friend of mine. I guess we could say that, you know, she's, you, you also know her, um, <laughs> but, uh, but I'll introduce her. It's Nancy French. This is David French's wife, uh, but, it, but so much more than David French's wife. Nancy French is a New York Times bestselling author, written a couple of her own really lovely books that I've enjoyed, as well as co-written a number of uh, other books with celebrities and um, she's among her many talents uh, she has added to her string investigative journalist and that's what we're having her here to talk about is that she's written a string of really groundbreaking articles covering uh, abuse at one of the most important institutions in at least in in a regional part of American Christianity and we'll get to that but first, Nancy, welcome. So glad you're, you're finally here with us on Good Faith. Hey, guys. So Thanks for having me. we're going to this news is going to be uh, going on a string of bad news that we have been enduring as a church, as a country. Uh, and my goodness, it has been a string of bad news. We've had now two mass shootings in the span of weeks. First, the one in Buffalo. And then most recently, the awful, they're all awful, uh, school shooting in Texas. Sandwiched in between that, we had a devastating report from the Southern Baptist Convention on the history of institutional abuse and neglect and denial of sex abuse within the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, it's just been like one bad news after another. And if you're a listener, you might be just feeling almost wincing internally, like, oh, my gosh, not another story of bad news of something horrible happening at one of our institutions. And uh, I want to actually help prepare all of us, including myself, on how to and why we listen to and we need to listen to bad news. And I want to draw from one of my favorite authors, Frederick Beekner. Who, and one of my favorite books of Beekner are called Telling the Truth. And the subtitle to Telling the Truth is The Gospel as Tragedy, Comedy, and Fairy Tale. I highly recommend this book for any Christian. It's a slim little quick read, but it's just so profound, especially if you are a pastor preacher. I, I just think this is almost required reading in my book. But he opens the book, and let me just read a few sentences. from These are the first few sentences from Telling the Truth. Gospels, Tragedy, Comedy, and Fairy Tale by Frederick Buechner. And he opens with this. The gospel is bad news before it is good news. The gospel is bad news before it is good news. It is the news that man is a sinner, to use the old word, that he is evil in the imagination of his heart, that when he looks in the mirror all in a lather, what he sees is at least eight parts chicken phony slob. That is the tragedy. But it is also the news that he is loved anyway, cherished, forgiven, bleeding to be sure, but also bled for. That is the comedy. And yet, so what? So what if even in his sin the slob is loved and forgiven when the very mark and substance of his sin and of his slobbery is that he keeps turning down the love and forgiveness because he either doesn't believe them or doesn't want them or just doesn't give a damn? In answer, the news of the gospel is that extraordinary things happen to him, just as in fairy tales, extraordinary things happen. So I begin with that quote because I think Buechner is onto a profound truth that the gospel is bad news before it is good news. Before we can get to the news of grace, of forgiveness, of repair and restoration, that is ultimately the end of that fairy tale that is the gospel, a true fairy tale. Uh, we have to actually go through the tragedy. We have to go through the bad news, which means we have to develop some muscles to be willing to look at, to listen to, to pay attention to bad news, even when the bad news is happening in our own midst, our own institutions, because that is how we get to the good news. And so that's with that, I want to 
ask Nancy to tell about the news that she broke about Kanaka camps. Um, and this is in a series of articles that she's written, reported on, that's now getting national attention. Uh, it has gotten national attention, but I think very recently is, I think uh, we have a feature coming out nationally on USA Today. And, um, and Nancy, I wanna first ask you to start by telling us why it's news, before you tell us the bad news, tell us why it's news. Why does Kanaka camps and what's happening there matter uh, for Christians and for, for, for our society, really? Let me explain what Canicut Camps is. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with this. It's located in Branson, Missouri. I had never heard of it before this was brought to my attention. Um, but it's located in Branson, Missouri. It has existed for 100 years. It uh, says that it has hosted half a million children um, every year. 20 to 25,000 kids go. Um, they call it the best sum of your, of your life. Um, it's very significant to... Uh, cultural Christianity. A lot of famous Christian celebrities send their kids there. They're associated with the camp. And it's just a pretty big deal. Um, it's sort of the camp for the evangelical elites. So when we talk about Canicut camps, it's not, you know, like the kind of camp I went to that was like a, a shack <laughs> right. with, you know, you can use the bathroom <laughs> in the woods. It's like a, you know, it's a multi, Canicut, Canis, uh, Canicut Ministries is a multi-million dollar international enterprise. Um, and so it was brought to my attention that uh, they may have some uh, things that needed to be reported on. And the reason why it's important is because it is so significant to cultural Christianity. It's so uh, significant uh, in pulpits across America. They're affected by the messages that come from Canacock, songs that are sung. Um, it's just a, an important place. And... I don't know if you guys know about Gretchen Carlson, who used to be with Fox News, who's been crusading against, not against non-disparagement agreements. But she was the first one who brought the word Canacuck into my vocabulary. Uh, she emailed me and she said, you know, I, I heard, uh, I was talking to some people and, and I heard that Canacuck Camp uses NDAs against sexual abuse victims, even underage sexual abuse victims. Can you look into that? That was the last thing I wanted to do. I remember David talking to you and, you know, I was just like, I think <laughs> I'll take this call because of my relationship with Gretchen. I really don't want to do this. Um, but I decided, I decided that because I'm in my late forties, I decided that I am an adult. I can deal with difficult things, Curtis, um, if it helps protect children. It's the last thing I want to do, but I'm grown. <laughs> You're a grown up, just that. like all of us are. And so, yeah, I'm a grown up. So I decided as the grown up that I am to look into it. I started having calls. I thought I was going to uncover something that related to NDAs and the ethics surrounding the use of NDAs against sexual abuse victims. But as I began to pull the thread, I discovered that there was a lot happening at Canacuck camps that needed to be known so that parents can be aware before they send their children there. The history of sex abuse at Canacuck camps and the history and the current cover-up as it pertains to that abuse. So let's walk through a little bit of that history, Nancy, because um, I was, you know, right there with you as you got the, you know, message from Gretchen Carlson as you started to look into this. And like you, I hadn't heard of Canacuck before. We both grew up in the Church of Christ, which is kind of on the outside, especially in the 70s and 80s, on the outside of evangelical culture in the U.S., we had our own camps. We had our own things. So I wasn't familiar with it. And then the next thing I know, as soon as I we start looking into Canacuck and you start looking into Canacuck, I realize it's everywhere. You know, the Christian music industry, uh, many of the biggest names, they center part of their year in Canacuck. You have um, almost anywhere I go when I mention the name Canacuck, Christians will say, oh, yeah, Canacuck, my son's a counselor there. I went there as a kid. It's it's tough to kind of overstate the importance of this summer camp uh, within the larger evangelical culture. And so, you know, 
as you begin to look at this, you start with what, what you thought was one incident, you, what you thought was one abuser, a, a person by the name of Pete Newman. And two things happen at once. One, you realize, wait a minute, to just call Pete Newman an abuser is an understatement of this person's uh, evil. And then number two, he's not the only one. Um, and number three, the, tr the truth uh, was concealed behind a wall of lies and intimidation. So I don't know if we can walk through all of those, um, you know, in one answer, but let, let's just start with what was the Pete Newman scandal, and then we'll go from there. So Pete Newman was uh, a counselor at Canicut Camps um, for, he, I think he started in 99. He was promoted throughout the ranks. He rose all the way up to the position of director. He was the face of the camp. He fundraised. Um, he was uh, promoted as a sexual purity expert. He was, uh, everyone loved him. And during his time at Canicut Camps, he participated in nude activities with children in a serial way. And parents complained Directors knew, Joe White, the COO, CEO of Canacock, knew. And they did not do anything to him. They didn't stop it. They didn't fire him. The, you know, they would try to have correctional memos. Um, but they knew that he was nude four-wheeling, skinny dipping, running through camps, having hot tub Bible studies with children parents would call and complain and say, you know, Pete Newman encouraged my child to get nude with him. Or when my child comes home from visiting with Pete Newman, he throws his jeans away. What is happening? Another parent reported to the camp that her daughter saw Pete Newman molesting someone. And the camp ignored all of that. Uh, so, th yeah, it's, uh, so as I started unwinding this, I pulled on the thread of Pete Newman and I discovered that there was this institutional malfeasance. It wasn't just one bad apple, bad things happen, it slipped through the cracks. It was this person was nurtured and promoted and congratulated and lauded for his connectivity to children. When that connectivity to children involved nudity, spiritually abuse. So one behavior. thing, so you're, t you're walking through what the camp knew. Okay, so the camp knew in 99, yeah. in 2000, in 2001, in 2003, in 2006, in 2008, it received all of these reports of nude four-wheeling, nude basketball, skinny dipping. Uh, someone in 06 reports that they saw him molesting someone. In 08, they were laughing about, uh, laughing about hot tub Bible studies. That's all what the camp knew, which is bad enough, which should have led to his firing in 99, right, when they first got the first nude report. What was he actually doing during that time, in addition to all of that? Um, so this is when you probably should not be listening with your kids. Um, I'm just going to try to say it in as discreet way as possible. He was promoted as a sexual purity expert. So Joe White would go to parents and say, hey, do you want to talk – do you, do you have uh, someone? Do you want someone to talk to your kids about sexual purity, masturbation, lust, that type of thing? Unbeknownst to parents, when they sent their kids to Canacuck at Canacuck camps in Pete Newman's hot tub, Pete Newman was teaching them about those things, but he was teaching them how to do that, how to do that to him, how to do that to themselves. It was a very toxic situation where their theology said, or at least their teaching said, that you can participate in all of these carnal pleasures as long as you're not lusting after women. And since we're all a bunch of guys and we're here in the hot tub together, let's do this. And he was also raping children and sodomizing them. It was, and the it's number bad. of victims, a few victims came forward for prosecution. He was ultimately uh, caught and arrested in 2009. A few victims came forward and testified against him. Um, 
But we talked to the prosecuting attorney and he estimated that the number of victims was in the hundreds, in the hundreds. So that's Pete Newman, who is one of the worst sexual predators um, I've ever heard about. And so walk us through once the camp knew, once the camp knew, or once the, once the camp had its hand forced is a better way of putting it. And um, how did the camp then treat Newman's victims? Immediately they went into uh, what I call the apology tour. Um, for some reason there was a six months lapse between Pete Newman's confession and his arrest in September of 09. During that time, immediately, Joe White and other camp leaders went to victims' families. They apologized, said they didn't know any of this was happening, said they were completely off guard. Also, by the way, let me pay your camp tuition for your kids for the rest of their lives. And do you want to go on a hunting trip with Joe White? Joe White is like this very charismatic, like select evangelical celebrity. Um, and so people were honored at the attention. He would offer fruit baskets, iPads, iPhones, hunting trips, just a host of gifts. And so all of these victims' families and some victims weren't even alerted. Some victims' parents weren't even alerted. So there was a gentleman in Amarillo, Texas, whose kid was acting weird. He called Joe White, and he was like, Joe, I feel like my son is, is, uh, has been abused by Pete. And Joe said, don't worry. I'm looking at the list, and your son's name is not on the list. And that wasn't true. His son's name was on the list. His son is, you know, one of the original Newman victims. His son is... Uh, you know, very damaged by this. But even at the outset, number one, victims were lied to, parents were deceived. Victims say that they believe Canicott Camps was trying to buy their silence. Um, and even, they, it was so unwanted. And sometimes Joe White would send notes saying, I'm your granddaddy, I'm your grandfather, we're family. And the victims were so upset about that that one family even had to file a restraining order against Canicut Camps so that they would stop mailing unwanted fruit baskets. Hey, sorry that you experienced this incredible trauma. Have you seen my pear selection? Is not the right way for an institution to rectify this terrible So situation. Nancy, how long uh, did Canicut really just know that they had a super predator in their midst and when was it when fi some final action was taken? What, what's the gap of how long they knew and did nothing other than try to buy off the silence of the victims? So I, I don't know when they knew that they had a super predator in their midst. I know that they knew that there was nude behavior serially for years and years and years and years. However, in March of 2009, Canicut Camps received Pete Newman's confession. So he walked into the office. He told everybody what happened. His hand was forced. A guy named Toby Nigebauer found out about it, threatened Pete that if he did not confess to the camp that he was going to have the FBI on his doorstep the following day. So Pete reluctantly confessed to camp. He even had a list of names. Um, told specifics about what he did. On that list, I think there are approximately 15 people. We now know that's uh, severely understating it. Pete left um, camp that day, and Joe White told everyone, hey guys, Pete Newman has a family emergency. He's not gonna be here. Uh, we ask for prayers for Pete. So Pete Newman leaves. He goes around the country, settles in Memphis, during the next six months, I have established that he worked at three different ministries. He was at least hired for three different ministries. And I've talked to the people that hired him. They were unaware that he was a super predator. One institution, which deals with children, even called Canicock, and Canicock did not alert them to the fact that Pete Newman had confessed to being a pedophile. Um, and so six months passed. And then in September of 09, he was finally arrested. It was a six-month 
laps, and I'm not exactly yeah, sure. Yeah, so what they knew of there. the nude activities starting in 1999, and so ten, so he operated on the camp ten years after they first received complaints that he was nude with young boys. So, and that's the Pete Newman story. Okay, it gets so, worse from there. Yeah, it gets worse from there. So, Nancy, you start talking to victims, uh, talking to victim families, and then what do you find out as you're, as you're investigating the Newman situation? So there's no information on this. There were a few local newspaper articles about the Pete Newman situation, but there was a guy named Randy Turner who had a blog in Missouri called the Turner Report. And he would just post updates about Pete Newman's trial. And beneath his com in his comments, beneath the articles, people would leave tips, like Hansel and Gretel leaving breadcrumbs. And they would be anonymous, and they would be oblique, and they would be confusing. But I, I read all of them. There was hundreds over the course of years. And someone might say something like this. Well, Pete Newman wasn't the first one. There was also a guy named Corby Dell Grimes there. So I think, okay, that's a unique enough name. I'll try to find out who that is. And by following all these paths, I was able to establish that there are, I think, nine Kanakuk-related convicted pedophiles. So those are people that have been connected with camp and were later revealed to be pedophiles or people who were pedoph had pedophilic behavior at camp and were caught. Um, and then there were a lot of people who had pedophilic behavior at camp and were caught and the camp did not do anything about it other than maybe a slap on the wrist or moving them around to a different place or maybe terminating them but giving them a job at a different Kanakuk affiliate, not alerting police, and they're still out there today. They haven't been caught. And so yesterday and today in USA Today, I name some of those names. Uh, I named two additional predators um, that no one is familiar with their stories and I put their names out there after establishing, establishing a certain level of evidence uh, that made me feel comfortable legally and morally. Yeah, I would call it there. establishing overwhelming evidence, including in one case by talking to one of the people who you asked him point blank if he was guilty of the abuse that um, – others had alleged, and his response was, haven't you ever done anything that you're sorry about or need repentance for? So that's the level of due diligence here. Nancy, say a little, oh, go ahead. Well, yeah, I, I want, yeah. I want, I mean, you, for folks who want to just get the, the, the details and the depth of Nancy's reporting that establishes, I think inconclusively, a long history of sexual abuse, multiple sexual abuse, uh, predators in Kanakuk, as well as Kanakuk's overwhelming refusal to do anything about it. Um, you can read these these articles. Nancy, I want to ask you if you can just give people a sense of the toll, the damage this has done, both the abuse itself, which I think people can sort of intuit, but I'd love you to just kind of shed a little more, just what it does to a child and a family to go through this in the abuse itself, but also to endure Kanakuk's response um, uh, to, to, to what happened. Like b on both levels, I think you're, you're discovering there's this profound damage that happens. And I wonder if you could just shed a little more detail and texture on that. Yeah, so people are traumatized by their sexual abuse and they live their lives under NDA so they feel like they can't even share their stories in therapeutic settings. One victim named Trey Carlock, who was from Dallas, told his sister that he didn't feel comfortable even telling his counselor about it and that he thought he would never be free from the trauma that haunted him. Um, he sadly died via suicide in 2019. The stories of death are overwhelming, and I'm going to try not to cry to talk about it, but um, I've received reports of probably uh, nine suicides and one suicide, so nine suicides of victims and No, take your time. Sorry, guys. These are, this is really hard stuff. Nine deaths associated with Pete Newman victims 
And then one death of a, of a predator. So what I found at Canicot is that there were a whole host of people who were abusing kids. One of them got caught by uh, a brave victim named Blake Fuge, cooperating with the Dallas police, and his predator died within hours of being caught. But the toll is very significant. And the blast radius is enormous. So the evil that was detonated in the bucolic Branson campgrounds um, sort of emanated throughout families across America. If one child was victimized in the family, other children were ignored. If there was one child that was victimized in the family, marriages were damaged. If there was one child that was victimized in a family, faith walks were destroyed. I mean, it destroyed communities, it, it destroyed lives, it destroyed families. It's just really bad. And the Bible says the wages of sin is no. death. And I regret that this has been played out over and over and over. At the camp, does not tell the truth about what happened. They're not telling the truth now about what happened then. And the cover-up continues, and people continue to die. So, you know, one thing I think is important is, you know, what let's, let's outline a lot of victims of now. They found their voice through you, Nancy, and through your writing and your reporting. And here's what they're asking of the camp is they are, they're just asking for accountability and truth. In other words, commission an independent investigation, release victims from non-disclosure agreements, let people give these victims their voice back. You know, one of the things that's very pernicious about this is that um, many of these cases came up. So, he, you know, a family learns that their kid, who's still a minor, is has been a victim. And so litigation, they file a lawsuit against the school, I mean school, against the camp, and then the camp engages in litigation and, and then tries to reach a settlement. And they ask the parents to sign a non-disclosure agreement on the, on behalf of their minor child. So their child, who's still a kid, has been has entered into a non-disclosure agreement that binds them for the rest of their life, or a confidential settlement agreement that binds them for the rest of their life, non-disparagement agreement that binds them for the rest of their life. And they were a kid when this happened. Now, parents are well-meaning. You know, they're they're facing a situation that they don't. What's how do you handle this? There's no playbook here, right? There's no playbook at all. Um, there's no right. No, there's no specific right way to go about dealing with this. So, you know, to take to to re achieve the settlement that they need to achieve to hire the and retain the counseling and and deal with all of the emotional and psychological fallout. They agree to these non-disclosure agreements, and then these kids grow up and they realize that in many ways the the camp just took their voice it didn't just uh, you know have a, a senior director that they had promoted and put as the face of the camp and put in people's homes even though they knew he'd been nude f with kids for 10 years it didn't just take their innocence it took their voice the camp did as well and and it, it's it's horrifying and yet still the way, one of the ways the camp deals with this is they'll they'll be saying, we know, look, we want you to be able to talk. We don't want anyone to be silenced. Now, the insurance company, on the other hand, the insurance company might have a different idea. So they're trying to have it both ways. We're the good guys who want you to talk. And then there's the bad guys at the insurance company. And the bad guys, they might have some different ideas about your settlement agreement. And it's really remarkable and yet curtis and yet the loyalty towards the leadership of that camp is unbelievable i have had people reach out to me and say are you trying to cancel canicuck and my response is this isn't mean tweets we're talking about here right this isn't somebody said something strange on social media this is systematic abuse that has been concealed behind a wall of non-disclosure agreements and manipulations and sometimes outright lies. Um, and, you know, I, I can't, I'm in awe of the work that Nancy has done over the last two years. 
I've never seen somebody um, so determined to obtain, to get to the truth and so careful about discerning the truth. So very careful. Everything that you read in the USA Today report, everything that you read in the dispatch uh, reports that uh, she did and we did together, uh, one, the first big story we did together, everything you read has been substantiated, has been checked with multiple sources. In many cases, we have videos, we have screenshots of emails, we have the legal documents. Um, this is something that is one of the more meticulously documented investigations of sexual abuse you'll ever see. And Nancy, you've interacted with the an institution of Kanakuk. I think there might be listeners that are like, what is going on? Why is Kanakuk responding the way that it is? First, why are they, why did, why did they hide uh, and deny the presence of predators in their camps and such to the fact that, you know, they would lie to parents point blank about whether their kid was abused, which as a parent is incredibly I, I don't. I lack words to describe the fury I would feel, and I do feel. But I, I would especially feel if a camp did that to me. If 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 they they not only permitted abuse, but then lied to my face that it was happening. Like what is going on in the heart? And as much as you can discern, what is going on in the hearts and minds that they would both lie about it and then also try to muzzle the voices of the victims? I, I can I can guess, but you know better what is going on in the sort of mind, heart, and spirit of Kanaka. What's your best take on, on, on what's motivating them? It takes me to a dark place when I try to answer why. Because it is so mystifying and it continues and they never really change. So, you know, they're trying to do better. So they put a, a website proclamation up that includes a lot of deceptive language, gaslighting, They'll put an 800 hotline number for victims. I call it, it doesn't work. They replace the hotline. I call it, it's not a reporting agency. I mean, it's like repeatedly they make bad decisions. They have never repented. People have speculated to me reasons. I, you know, try to very, you know, stick to the facts, stick to my reporting. Um, but Curtis, you have studied institutions for a long time and your writings on institutional um, sort of posturing towards scandal has helped me understand Kanakuk maybe a little better. Um, and you recently wrote an article about, about that that sort of tied to FBC, to Kanakuk and Ravi Zacharias' organization. So maybe you could share. Well, that. you know, I, this is where I actually uh, find it helpful to keep repeating what I repeated here on Good Faith, this theological truth that it's that institutions, human institutions, uh, are images of God, that they also in their own way bear the image of God, and just like individuals do. And while that is helpful for us to, to answer the question why we ought to care about institutions, why they matter because they're images, it also gives us the diagnosis for what happens when, Im when those image-bearing human beings called institutions, when they sin, uh, and it's and when institutions no longer well when any being no longer is imaging God uh, they are, end up imaging themselves that their own image is the thing that is upheld as upheld as the highest value and I think that's what's going on is that Kanakuk just like the Southern Baptist Convention was afraid of its own public image being tarnished in any way and so rather than actually imaging God by imaging God the, in, in their repentance, in their uh, care for the victims, in, in, in trying to bring about healing, in confession. Rather than imaging God that way, they were upholding their own image as a perfect, great camp that you could keep, you could keep sending your kids to and keep the money flowing. And so when an image starts imaging itself, not God, but becomes becomes more concerned with its own image, the Bible has a term for that, and that's called an idol. An idol is an image that is just referencing no longer God, but pointing back to itself, upholding itself. And the Bible predicts what happens when uh, an image becomes an idol. That idol becomes a, a idol that ultimately demands sacrifice. 
And we see this in scripture where idols demand oftentimes even human sacrifice, even child sacrifice. This is a, uh, in, in a passage in the Old Testament talks about Moloch, the, this idol that demanded child sacrifice, literal child sacrifice um, to itself, because that's its way of saying, I am the greatest thing. I, my image is the thing that must be upheld. All other things, including even human well-being, human life, even the life of children, ought to be sacrificed to, my, to the priority of me being upheld above all else. And I think what we have here in Kanakuk in the Southern Baptist Convention story in the Ravi Zechariah story is Moloch. It's the story of Moloch, a story of an idol uh, that no longer is pointing towards God, but is in fact upholding its own image and demanding sacrifice, quite literally the sacrifice of women and children in order that its image be fed. And that's, that is the bad news in all of this. And it ought to, ought to give us a great sobriety uh, in terms of kind of the, 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 the depth of hu where human sin goes, that especially when it takes institutional forms, it can get really bad. Um, so that's, that's you know, my take. Thing you know, and talking about this and moving from Kanakuk to the SBC and sort of uh, the SBC scandal, you know, one of the things about the SBC scandal that was so striking was how the SBC legal team and the executive committee was so focused on institutional self-preservation yeah. that they were willing to expose their fellow Baptists, you know, women and children, to extraordinary risk, but were often at the same time bragging that their their measures that they took to sort of separate the larger, um, the larger convention the, or the larger in, denominational entity from the actions of individuals was so successful that nobody had ever sort of accomplished what was called escalating liability. In other words. No one was ever able to hold the SBC's executive committee or the 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 SBC itself liable for um, the sexual abuse of one of its pastors. And so this was considered a real legal accomplishment, this sort of self-preservation instinct. And we see this at Kanakuk as well. It's this the one thing that cannot, the one thing that cannot be threatened is the existence of the institution. So yeah. that is the ultimate value. The existence of the institution is the ultimate value. And that point, that once that happens, you are incredibly vulnerable to a message from a lawyer or other advocate who comes in and he says, I'm going to save the institution. My, my advice will save the ministry. And this is where you get the non-disclosure agreements. This is where you get aggressive litigation tactics. This is where you get the SBC on the one hand, publicly separating itself from the actions of its individual churches, even though behind the scenes they're compiling lists of abusers that they don't share with anybody, that this is a world in which institutional self-preservation becomes the highest value. And, you know, it's hard to imagine, it's hard to imagine in ethos more directly contradicted by the cross. Yeah. So... The cross says, not even my life is of the highest value, much less the 501c3 organization, right. not even my life. And yet again and again, we, we're going to save the ministry. We're going to save the ministry. Well, I love that reference to the cross as the image, as the true image of God. Uh, where we give up our lives for the sake of others, for the sake of God, and for the sake, of, especially for the sake of others. And this is precisely what Kanakuk, uh, SBC, Arzim for a number of years just refused to do. Um, that's, and so, but, so we've been talking about the bad news. I promised at the beginning that we have to go <laughs> through the bad Curtis, news. I was wondering, Curtis, where? <laughs> to go through the good news. And, and here's, yeah. here's where I see the good news, which is, first of all, uh, we shouldn't be surprised. We're shocked, and we, we ought to, you know, at some level truly be shocked because we ought to be morally outraged at it. And so we can't lose that shock. But there's a difference between the shock and being surprised. Um, and uh, we ought not to be surprised by this because, again, the Scripture gives us a narrative that explains this. Like, And, again, this is why I believe 
bring institutions back into the biblical narrative is so important because it enables us then to hear stories of institutional sin and not be surprised. Like we're like, oh yeah, the, the Bible tells us about sin and that sin is not just individual, but it's also institutions because ins institutions are human in their own way. Uh, and they're going to be prone to idolatry and, and, uh, and upholding itself and its survival as the highest good. So, you know, at one level, there's a there's the beginning note of a good news and saying, OK, wait a minute, we shouldn't be surprised. And then we also should expect that God is not going to remain on the sidelines of this, that we have a God that does not just allow human sin ultimately to win out in its desire to conceal itself and uphold itself above all else. And Nancy, this is just where, you know, this is, I'm, you're going to be sort of uh, demur, I think your tendency is going to demur this, but quite frankly, you're a sign of good news for me in this because you are somebody that on the surface should have had no reason, like you said, to pursue this story. I mean, this is not, you're, you were not a private investigator. The, there was no professional interest. You're not getting paid to do these years and years of work. And yet, yet I believe, have been your friend and listening to you, that God was stirring something in you and in your spirit to say, no, 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 you're my appointed person to go do something about this. Um, and this is, this is how God works. This is how we begin to turn towards the good news. So Nancy, could you share with how God has been moving in you to, to actually take this on and, and how you've experienced God even through it uh, in the work in yourself? Because I, as at least, you know, from my perspective, feel like God has been all over it, even if maybe on your end, you have felt and asked that question, like, where is God amidst all this? It's been quite evident to me. So Tell us a little bit about what it's been like spiritually to be to feel called to this enterprise of shedding light into this darkness. I was the victim of uh, church sex abuse or abuse in the context of the church community when I was a kid. And it's something that I haven't talked about. I wrote a 2016 Washington Post um, editorial about it and sort of made one statement about it, but didn't want to talk about it more. In the process of investigating Canacock, I sort of felt empowered to speak out. If you're abused as a kid, you're groomed not to speak out about such things. So almost every step of the way, I sort of had to force myself to say, okay, this is the right thing. You know, Jesus calls himself the truth. We don't have to be afraid of the truth. We're not God's PR arm. We're not responsible for marketing God in the best possible way. God is not fragile. God can, uh, you know, handle the truth. Um, and so I sort of had to like reprogram myself almost every day, almost every second to be able to speak out, uh, you know, courageously and without fear and without apology. And so that was an interesting process. And so additionally, in the course of this investigation, I called my former preacher who was sort of, who sort of oversaw the the church during my time of abuse and I talked to him and I realized that a lot of the adults in my congregation were aware of the abuse that was happening wow. at the time and they didn't for whatever reason speak out and so I realized with much clarity that I'm a grown woman I um, have my own volition and agency and I'm not going to be one of those people who refuse to speak out when I know that children are in danger so in spite of all the discomfort, I decided, okay, I'm going to be able to do this. Now, the victims uh, from Canacock, who I now consider uh, survivors because they're amazing. I've seen them sort of transform from one category to the other over the course of the past two years. They have inspired me. And so um, they, their courage and their bravery and um, their ability to sort of deal with the complexity of their situation sort of empowered me to deal with the complexity of my situation. So I had sort of a parallel track where I was trying to per pursue justice to a degree in my own situation while I could see them pursuing justice in their situations. And all of that is sort of inadequate. Like, um, you know, Curtis, you've been very helpful to me. I know I've called all of you guys crying many times. But um, one of the things that you said to me was that we're not going to achieve perfect justice here and that I am merely a signpost 
um, trying to point to the future where all tears will be dried and all things will be made new. And maybe could you share some of that because you helped me sort of come through some. Well, of I, I, you know, no, you, you were the one that helping me to see this because the, in the midst of such dark stories, again, Canuck just being one in a string of stories of institutions becoming idols like this. I really have been looking for like, well, God, where are you amidst all this? And and Nancy, I really do feel like walking with you through the story of God redeeming your own personal story as a victim of abuse to actually be his voice uh, calling for repentance and repair. That that has been the sign of hope for me. And, and I because that is really how God works. God works through the broken, through and repairing them to be agents of repair for others. So I see the gospel story and the turn from the bad news to the good news really through through your own calling and work in this, which let me just underline because I, I, I know this is going to come out in, in the Canuck response to this. Uh, Nancy was not, Nancy has not profited at all from this. Quite the contrary, Nancy has foregone a large sums of lucrative money that she could be making doing her writing career to instead pursue this this calling from God. And so, you know, if you read anything that suggests that this is a, uh, a commercially motivated enterprise, that is the furthest thing from the truth. It is actually something that is motivated by the gospel in my mind, and, and it's inspiring to me. And I do think that what you just said is actually is an important word about that we are we are signposts to the day when God is finally going to deliver justice. And by justice, I mean both what the perpetrators really deserve and also what the victims deserve in, in the form of healing and restoration. And it's not going to be perfect this side of the, the final restoration when Jesus returns to make all things new. It's But our calling is to point to that. Our calling is to be signposts to that, just like you said. And I read the story, I read your own personal story and journey to this very much as that kind of signpost. And it's it should be a reminder to us all um, that we have a role to play in this. You know, it, it, you may be listening to this and thinking, well, it's a good thing I'm not sending my kid to Canuck or I never even heard of Canuck. But the reality is that the same dynamics that led Canuck, Southern Baptist Convention, Ravi Zacharias Ministries, that same dynamic that the Bible outlines as when images become idols, that is a temptation that is going to face any institution, religious, Christian, or secular. Every institution is going to face this temptation to be uh, to to to, to um, kind of degrade from being an image uh, to an idol, and uh, we all, I think, have to take some inspiration, Nancy, from your example in that. We, we may be called to be the voice that calls an organization to repentance and, and at least calls sheds light on what is happening. And that's going to be true in our schools. It could be true in your business. Uh, it could be true in a community association you're a part of. But every organization is going to be uh, sort of face this temptation of sin because they're human. It's a human sin to elevate our own image above our image bearing um, function. And so... Nancy, maybe on that light, in that in that light, can you share with listeners who may even be right now as they're listening to this, be coming to terms with, wow, okay, so maybe my company isn't uh, perpetrating sex abuse, but in their own way, they are trying to elevate their own image above their their purpose and mission to in some way bear and reflect God's purposes even even in secular organizations have that function and maybe they're coming aware like they may be asking well what what am I supposed to do how do I discern my own sense of calling with an institution that is prone to idolatry what advice would you give to somebody as if they think maybe I, am I supposed to follow Nancy's footsteps in my own context Yeah, I, I don't really know. I, I don't have any answers. As a person, a storyteller, a journalist, my only goal was to tell the story. And so frequently people say, well, what should I uh, go to this church that's associated and promotes Canuck? Should I go to family camp? It means a lot to my family. Should I stop working at K-Life or 
Hanukkah Institute or Kids Across America when they have these associations. And I don't really know because I feel like it's all personal. I don't feel like I should ask people to uh, do things where I'm not bearing the cost of it. I feel like everybody has different roles to play. I don't even know. I even think that I believe and know that Kanakuk has been responsible for a lot of good. Um, in fact, some of the best people I've ever met have been through this investigation. I love all of my sources. It's just been amazing. But when something, when an institution has decided that they are completely fine to lie to the public, to cover up sex abuse, and to do things that Kanakuk is doing, we need to pay attention. We need to hold. We people need to hold them responsible. If that means, uh, you know, thinking, rethinking your summer plans. You know, like someone, a very dear source, texted me last night and was considering. You know, we love family camp. My kids learn a lot about Christianity there, um, and I want to go. And I wrote back. Um, you know, they can learn a lot more about Christianity by not going. You know, there's a lot to Christianity more uh, poignant and. Uh, true about not participating in uh, an institution that allows child abuse to proliferate on their grounds and lies about it uh, and continues to spit, try to spin their way out of it. So I don't really know, Curtis, like what each individual should do. I feel like God like put this in front of me and like the one step that I knew was true is that I should look into it. And then when I looked into it, the one step that I knew to be true was to try to corroborate it. And then when I corroborated it, you know, I just went down the list. And many times, David and I, I remember at one point we were sitting out on the front porch and I just learned some just terrible things and I, I didn't exactly know how to process it. And David said something that I thought was very salient and very good. Uh, he's been amazing to go through this process with. But he just said, what's the next right thing to mm. do? And, you know, it was just like this incremental thing. And he goes, just do that. And so I just wow. did that. And it just kept pushing That's me right. in this propulsion toward today, which is when USA Today finally, uh, you know, let a lot of my, I, I probably have published 3% of what I know. Hmm. So in USA Today, it's pretty comprehensive. Y'all are probably sick of reading my 5,000 word articles about Canica. Just know that there is a lot that I know um, and I'm just trying to, you know, make this easy for everyone to understand. And, uh, you know, it's just all complicated. And we know the reason it's complicated is because they don't want us to understand what's going on. So, Nancy, what you said about Im information, I think, is really, really important. Um, and also the when you're also talking about, well, you don't know exactly what to say to all of these folks, um, you know, it, your role in this is to tell the truth. Your role in this is to provide the information uh, that people need to have. And then it is different individuals' roles to respond to that. And what the problem that you had before your reporting is that people were approaching that institution really under a set of false pretenses. They're approaching it in a way, believing it was one thing when it was another thing. And, you know, I can't remember if I said this before, but, you know, I've, I've had people say, well, what are you trying to do? Cancel Canacuck? Um, you know, as if this was mean tweets or whatever that we we're talking about rather than systematic years of systematic sexual abuse. And and, you know, no, what we're trying to do is tell the truth. What we're trying to do is spur the institution to tell the truth and spur the institution to take a very, very hard look at itself. Um, look, that's what the Baptist, you know, when we look at the SBC scandal, there are two things happening at once. One is we're now learning of years of horrific behavior, just horrific stuff. If you read that report, it's, un, it's, it's tough to read in, in some places. But there's another story, too. And the other story is these Baptist messengers, that's what the Baptists call delegates to their convention, said, enough open the books. We want to know it all. We want to know it all, good, bad, and ugly. And they did something that I hadn't really seen done before. And that is, they said, not only do we want an outside investigation, you're going to waive attorney-client privilege to do it. That's a big freaking deal to waive attorney-client privilege. 
And there were people who objected. They said that might get rid of our insurance coverage. You hear that word again that came up earlier in the conversation, insurance. Um, it might get rid of insurance coverage. And they said, nope, we're doing it. You have to do it. And they did it. And they did it. And they exposed the good. They, I mean, they exposed the bad. They exposed the ugly. And now there's a chance for some good to emerge. Um, you know, for the first time, you're having people who, there was one, one um, survivor of abuse who recorded that years ago when she went to the executive committee, one of the members of the executive committee turned his back to her turned his back to her another one chortled that was the word used chortled at her as she's addressing addressing the executive committee and this is a person who was sexually abused as a kid as a t young teen by a southern baptist pastor and so now there's an there's finally an opportunity to be heard and that's one thing you know as nancy was saying that what you what we are seeing is and what we're what we're seeing is that people who've been silenced for a long, long time are having an opportunity to be heard. They're getting their voice back. And that seems to me to be a prerequisite for some measure of justice here. And not only justice, but I think, again, to reiterate, I think the good news here for me, because I think it's so helpful, David, that you pointed out that this other half of the story of the Southern Baptist Convention is the courage and resolve of these messengers to really press their own institution to repentance. And that to me, to the point of even costly repentance, right? Um, in terms of that waiving that privilege. And that to me is a sign. That's a sign of good news that God is not absent. God is not inactive. He is moving by his spirit in the hearts and minds and actions of his people to say no more. Like we will not be complicit in this and we will uh, we have a role to point our organizations back to their true image-bearing function, and why you know Nancy's story, like I said, continues even as I you know as it is full of bad news. It ultimately leads to good news because I don't believe Nancy, Nancy's uh, work in doing this and the work of the messengers in the Southern Baptist Convention or the work of Rachel Den Hollander uh, right. in her own campaign or the work of all of um, what our good friend Ruth. The Hulcher did it with the Robbie Zacharias scandal. None of it makes sense unless, to me anyways, unless God is real. Unless God is real and active in his people. Because none of these people are benefiting from that, from that work yeah. financially or otherwise or their reputation. They are taking on great pain and suffering and toil. And it only makes sense if God is active at work in them to be his agents of repair and, and a call for repentance and that we should take good news for that. And that would be my my word to any listener uh, out there is, you know, if you're wondering if you're discouraged by the good news of how broken our institutions are, you're part of some institution that is probably struggling as well. Uh, and the, the good news that you're looking for starts with you. You are the bearer of the good news. That's that's the, your part in the story. Uh, and the question is, like, what is the uh, Nancy? I loved that phrase that, that of the, your description of your own sense of calling, which is, you know, the question for you then is, well, what is the next right thing for you to do? Like, David, that's such great pastoral advice. You, you should. <laughs> <laughs> I would almost think you're the former pastor here. Um, but no, that is exactly right. Like, we don't have the plan. We don't know where this all leads in any of these stories. But we are called to be the next, to do the next right thing. And out of that, I really am confident that that's where the good news emerges. You know, and I'm also comforted by this, you know, the, seeing the truth of the scripture, nothing that is hidden will not be revealed. Mm. And, and that's, an, that's a part of this that I think, and this is something, it's a warning, it's a shot across the bow, <laughs> if you will, of people who think, well, yep, I can preserve my institution, I can bury this truth. And we're seeing, what we're seeing again and again right now in our culture is truths that people spent enormous amounts of money, enormous amounts of energy to bury are bubbling up. You know, if you look at the Ravi Zacharias situation, they spent a million dollars in this first in the first claim against Ravi. Um, they spent a million dollars to sue 
the person who brought the claim against Ravi, then settle it, and then try to keep it all confidential. I mean, think about those resources. There's now a lawsuit that money was raised by the uh, institution and under false pretenses. Um, and there's nothing that's hidden that will not be revealed. And and you see this again, short-term, medium-term thinking that is, you know, look again, that's it's institutional self-preservation, but then at the end of the day, it all emerges anyway. It that's all right. emerges anyway. And and so, and I think that that is, that is good news. It is good news. And in the end, we know that the story ends with the truth being revealed and the, uh, the, the healing that comes when Jesus returns. And that's, you know, it, in the secular age, it feels almost strange to utter those words as the, res as the Christian hope and the Christian response to all this bad news. But that really is the gospel. That is why the, the, the tragedy ends up as a, as a true fairy tale. Um, so until that day, we have our own, we still though have to, are in the muck of, of, uh, of human brokenness and fallenness. And so Nancy, like what, what do you think happens next here as we are still in the middle of this story? What happens to the, to, to, what do you think, where does this Kanakuk story go both for Kanakuk, but also for you, uh, you and David, like what, 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 what is coming down the road potentially for you guys as you're part of this story? Uh, and, and also how can listeners pray for you guys as, as a result? Yeah, well, since we've been uh, reporting this podcast, Kanakuk has updated their response to our journalism. I, I haven't read it carefully, but one phrase that stuck out was uh, I, they said in this day of 24-7 uh, news cycle, copy and paste journalism is running rampant. Uh, for two years of dedicating almost every second of my life to this, the 24-7 news cycle, that is accurate because that's how long uh, it's taken me every day, every week um, to crack this case. Um, so I think Kanakuk has an opportunity to tell the truth. Their website update doesn't seem like they're going to. Um, I'm not really sure what that means for us. I'm not an investigative journalist by trade. I do ghostwriting. Um, I write books. Um, so I don't know how long the story will continue, but every day I get new victim re reports. Uh, yesterday I got two reports of two female victims, two new female predators, different eras. They weren't on my list. It brings it up to 32. Um, I want to complete the story, um, you know, so I'm just not sure what that means. All right. Well, um, thank you, Nancy. Thank you for all your work. Um, thanks for joining thank us on the you. podcast. And uh, we'll, we'll call it a podcast for the day. And thank you, listeners, for listening. And uh, please rate us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Please um, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And um, please check out Curtis's work at redeemingbabble.org and mine at thedispatch.com. And we will be back next Saturday.